having me here, and thanks to Dave and the organizers. Congratulations again, Dave. I agree with Sushita, you, you deserve it. I hope we have wine here soon just to celebrate. <laughs> anyway, so with my talk, so it's better that way. So anyway, so Dave asked me to talk about national and global inequities in epilepsy care in capturing non-traditional patients. Let me see if I have better luck than Sushita yet. Nothing to disclose here. So my objectives are for you to recognize disparities in epilepsy care and identify potential solutions to minimize these disparities and improve patient care. First, let me define disparities. So disparity or disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. But let's talk about epilepsy patients as a whole. Let's ask, are they a disadvantaged population just because they have the diagnosis of epilepsy? Let me show you this retrospective claims-based study from Medicare and Medicaid data, including about 60,000 people with epilepsy. And you see that 37% of patients who receive a diagnosis of epilepsy receive no treatment up to three years after diagnosis. What about specific groups? Well, this retrospective study from California showed that blacks and Hispanics with epilepsy were less likely to have access to a specialized care. And patients who receive care in a specialized centers have access to higher quality of care than patients that receive care elsewhere. So and that proves that simply providing healthcare insurance is unlikely to eliminate disparities. And the problem is not just with blacks and Hispanics. We can see here that from Medicaid data that there are significant racial and ethnic disparities in obtaining diagnosis with American Indians, Alaskan Natives, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians, and of course, delaying treatment for these patients. And you can see here in this map where the epilepsy centers are located, and you see that most of them are located in capital cities and big urban areas, and some states are underserved by them, especially Montana, Wyoming, where native populations are there, Alaska. So we know now why patients living in rural areas have fewer epilepsy surgery procedures, right? There are many factors. Epilepsy providers are located in urban centers. They are not in rural areas. Visiting these centers, as we heard before, may not be feasible for many patients. You have to travel. You may not have the money to go to these centers. And there is lack of knowledge of a specialist by these community, uh, doctor, I'm sorry, but the community doctors, and something is happening here. Let me just go back if I can. Uh, yes, we're there. So the primary care providers in these rural areas don't know how to contact the specialists. We know that black patients and patients with public insurance, as we mentioned before, are receiving epilepsy surgery at lower rates than um, in prolonged waiting period compared to other patients with drug refractory epilepsy. Actually, look at this report by the North American, this is the North American, I repeat, commission of the ILAE, that show that there is substantial evidence that in North America, minorities with epilepsy may be receiving lower levels of care than non-minority patients. And the problem is not just in the US, in Canada. They have a lot of aboriginals in Canada, I think they mentioned that. Aboriginals with epilepsy were less likely to see a neurologist, forget about an epilepsy specialist. What about pediatrics? <clears throat> well, there is evidence to suggest that health disparities are also prevalent in pediatric. And we know that race and ethnicity are the strongest and most consistently 
documented areas of disparity. And why is that? That's because we have very few pediatric studies that focus on socioeconomic health and very little information about inequities related to gender, limited English proficiency, or immigration status. That's the KID database, that's a, a pediatric database that show that African Americans and Hispanics have lower rates of surgical treatment, that's pediatrics, when compared with white counterparts. We have been talking about that in the morning. This Canadian study uh, show also lower rates of or, or longer time to epilepsy surgery when you have lower socioeconomic status and also poorer seizure control after epilepsy surgery. So that data show that disparities in epilepsy care are pervasive and they tend to persist through time. And that, that's national. So I'm going to move a little bit more globally right now. And let me show you that this is a statement here from the ILE Task Force on Access to Treatment. It showed that availability of anti seizure medications is different across countries based on World Bank income classification. Hmm. So now let me show you evidence that socioeconomic factors are the main drivers for epilepsy care around the world. You can see from this study coming from Asia that all new generation anti seizure medications were unaffordable in most low medium income countries, in Asia, of course. In essential or basic anti seizure medications, such as Balpray in Sri Lanka and all medications in India, were unaffordable to the local population. And we know that in most low income countries, payment of medication comes out of pocket. Right? So that's a problem. This graphic shows here availability of basic first line anti seizure medication. Blue here is widely available, orange is limited access, and gray is not available. You see here in high income countries, you see a lot of blue. We expect that some medications are highly available, widely available. But here in low income countries, you see a lot of orange already. So access to this medication is very limited. What about second? or third generation, meaning newer medications. Again, in high-income countries, widely available. In low-income countries, you see a lot of gray, almost not available, or very, very limited access for newer medications. So again, socioeconomic status. Epilepsy surgery in low- and middle-income countries, what is going on? It's a review of 148 articles. Show that, yes, some countries in Asia and Latin America have epilepsy surgery. But the centers are located in larger cities, and most of the time driven by, the, by a highly motivated neurosurgeon that lives in the country, usually in the capital city. So he has a few patients operated, not established practice in the country, and the most common uh, operation is a temporal lobectomy. And we're seeing that in El Salvador. Also. Another important factor globally, and that's very important, I want to focus here, is the limited number of trained health professionals. Let me share with you this paper we just published with the International Child Neurology Association. We interviewed 177 countries here, and we found that the greatest deficits in child neurologists and access to training were in low-income countries. And about 75% of low-income countries lack access to child neurologists. Most of these countries were in Africa and in Southeast Asia. You can see here, actually, in green, you see countries that have the highest number ratio of neurologists. You see the countries in red, they have zero child neurologists. And I repeat, zero child neurologists. So, and so we also look at access to training, and that's very important. You see in red, training program availability here, and in blue, countries with child neurologists. And you can see here in high income countries, 95% of the countries have training available. And of course, 
100% of high-income countries have child neurologists. Right? We're here. Low-income countries is a different story. You see that only 5% of these countries have access to training, and that's worldwide. And about probably 35 to 37% of the countries have access, truly access, to child neurologists. So what about distribution of neurologists? We can see here that most countries have neurologists working in capital cities here in green and big urban areas here in light blue. But there is a scarcity of neurologists in rural areas here in purple, 0% in low-income countries. You say, why, why is that important? Why is we're representing this? Well, we, we hear all the time this data that there are about 50 million patients with epilepsy globally, but the problem is that 80% live in rural populations, right, in low-income countries. So you see the problem with access we have. So the treatment gap is very high. We know that. Let me just talk about potential solutions in the last part of my talk. Can we do something about this? Well, national strategies, locally, I think we need to increase local research about disparities in epilepsy care and analyze multiple variables, not just race and ethnicity, but multiple variables, and see how these variables interact between each other. Can we increase the number of non-traditional patients in our centers? I think yes, through collaboration between communities and rural areas and epilepsy centers. That is a must. Developing training modules about efficacy of epilepsy surgery for PCPs and neurologists working there in rural areas so they are trained. Educational sessions for patients and their families. Use of telehealth, now we can do it to support rural areas or communities with no access to care. And of course, minimize the economic burden for these families right? that come from far away, maybe with a program coordinator. Globally, I think we have to support primary care physicians because as I showed you, many countries don't have child neurologists, so you have to, to help them. And I think Every academic institution has a role. We can promote international outreach educational programs with low-income countries. I know you are doing it here in Austin. We have to support epilepsy surgery programs in poor resource countries. We are doing it in El Salvador when possible. And use of telehealth between large academic centers and poor resource settings. I think it's doable. We have to develop institutional programs to accept international Surgical referrals, I think. There are many ways to do that. Creation of special programs to offer epilepsy surgery to international patients with limited economic resources, not just with, <clears throat> with insurance, but also with limited economic resources. Academic institutions play a very important role, and I know, I know Dave has been supported by, by UT here to develop multiple programs in the Caribbean to improve access to EEG, epilepsy care, and even epilepsy surgery. We uh, collaborated with the, with the Child Neurology Society to develop training programs in Africa, implementing ketogenic diet, creating EEG labs. We have been working for, for many years. Had the opportunity to serve as the chair of the um, International Committee, so a lot of support from Child Neurology Society. Then we join forces with IGNA, International Child Neurology Association. Now we have different, different programs in, in different countries with different doctors. This is Pakistan, and we have a very underserved population. And I don't know why this is coming here, but I'll, I'll try to, to see if something can better. Anyway, so this is a slide I wanted to share with you just to, to finish. We proposed a long time ago a common platform model where all societies come together, we're trying to, to achieve that, has been very difficult because societies don't communicate between each other. So we don't know what we are doing, right? We had that problem that the, uh, we were uh, targeting, we were working on a mission in Cuba at some point, and two societies were working on different, we didn't communicate, we didn't have that. 
So we try to develop a common platform to develop more efficient, long-term sustainable projects. We're working on that. We have already almost three societies. It's not easy to work on that. But also with the help of academic institutions, private companies, local governments, foundations, and of course, local leaders, right? Because local leaders know their needs, the local needs and the availability of resources. And, and I wanted to show you some slides that put here, just to finish some pictures of, of many wonderful programs, including epilepsy surgery, but I don't think they are here. Dave, I think that was not updated, but that's okay. I just want to, to tell you in the last minute, I'm on time, I still have two minutes, so. Uh, uh, that the slides that they couldn't show, um, we, I wanted to show you, uh, especially the, the experience we had in, in a very poor country, El Salvador, I'm from El Salvador, so we have been working for many years just to illustrate the problems developing epilepsy surgery programs. We were successful for the first four years. We did some hemispherectomies, temporal lobectomies, and, and we were training neurosurgeons locally through a hybrid program, a, a, a foundation driven by a little girl that was our patient with economical resources. We operated in the United States, and she figured out that in El Salvador, a family uh, earns usually most of the families $200 a month or, or lower income, so they couldn't pay epilepsy, sorry, they couldn't even pay medications. So she developed, she's a powerhouse, and developed uh, many fundraising activities. Now we have medications for these kiddos, just for, started with a little girl, and, and, and resources, EEG machines, and things like that, and now we are doing it again. So just to finish, I tell you, after many years of changing government, we couldn't go in, and the program stopped. Very frustrating, right? Because you say, wow, it worked for so hard. But anyway, when you work internationally, you figure it out. You just do the best you can and you wait. for Don't get frustrated. And then five years later, the government opened again and we are revisiting that through this child, this foundation. And now we started doing the first operations again, including cortical dysplasias and, and things like that. And kiddos that we couldn't do it. So the point is it takes collaboration. I think the role of academic institution is huge. Societies are a catalyzer of things, but at the end of the day, most of people that are involved work in academic institutions. So you need to negotiate time, you need to convince administration that we have to play a role uh, uh, improving epilepsy care in, uh, an, at a global level. So with that, I want to thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Excellent talks and tough talks because it's a very broad topics. So you guys are great. Um, Dave. Yeah, no, no, ex excellent talks, but a, a couple of things. Um, and both will end up being questions, so bear with me. So the World Bank, and you know this, Jorge, the criteria of high income is above $12,000 a year. So if you make $12,001 and you make $66,000 a year, you have the exact same interest rate if you borrow money. So it's actually good for governments to stay middle income, which is counterintuitive and sad. But I'm saying that because in small island states, Papua New Guinea, islands in the Caribbean, there's nuance. And the nuance is because of size, etc., and support, they may not be able to do or even follow anything related to the ILA. But those folks, and many in Africa, are not included as thought leaders. So you have thought leaders from Europe and the US suggesting <coughs> what they think is feasible. Two questions out of that. One, how do we facilitate change nationally so that they have people on equal footing discussing things and not some people telling people what to think? And the second thing is, you alluded to this and we have spoken about this, how do we create sustainability so that a change in government may not affect sustainable change? I know two very difficult questions, but I think important.
OK, yeah, there's, let me see. Yeah, yeah, very, <clears throat> very important questions, Dave. Let me go in reverse. Let me answer the second one first, because I think it's, it is very important. Yep, um, I think <clears throat> we, through history, when we started engaging in international outreach projects to create programs in other countries, we have learned so much. We, I think <clears throat> we, and I, I was guilty for that, we started with the idea so we know what the country needs and, and we're going to this number one. So, so we, we knew what. And, and that was the first mistake. The second mistake was that we didn't think long term. Um, we were uh, creating training on the way with not a curriculum to do things uh, more standard in, in a way. That the second mistake. And the third mistake, the most important one, was that we didn't take into consideration multiple factors, including government, instability of governments in many low income countries, um, and socioeconomic and cultural factors. So that's right. So to create now, to, we have revisited that even at the CNS to create sustainable programs. Uh, we need to think about that. And you, you, you were with me in a, in a very similar meeting too. To, so we have to take into consideration the local needs, make sure the local team is ready to accept this. We know what they need and we provide this. And we go with the objective to train local resources, but they can at some point can work alone and they don't need us. And that's the difficult part. That's why I put this slide, we need huge collaboration for that. It's not easy. It's probably easier to train basic epilepsy, even that's difficult in EEG. But when we go to the surgery aspect, we are involved in more problems because we need the resources, as I mentioned. Sandy was talking about the oasis. Sandy's here. If the, Sandy, you said that, that you had that oasis, and it's true, but most of the time we don't have that oasis, right? So it's a problem. We go to places that don't have even a 3T MRI, they have a 0.5. In the sub, they have a 0.5 MRI. We have to be working with that. <clears throat> so we need to be creative to do things. And so, so you, you need to, to be sure you have the, the infrastructure to create something sustainable. So what we are doing right now is we're assessing very importantly, the needs, especially in Latin America, what we can achieve and what programs we can create. Uh, if we cannot create surgery, most of the programs we're not doing in most of the countries. We cannot, we, we think we're not ready for that step. So, so the, the short answer is more analysis to the situation because it's difficult, taking in consideration these three factors and seeing how we create training, local training that's going to be you know, ongoing when we're not there. Nationally, it's more difficult. I think nationally, um, we have, again, to take into consideration loss of every state. Every state is different. I'm from Ohio. We try to help kids from West Virginia. And it has been very difficult sometimes. They are very, even by telehealth, we have many big population. Medicaid West Virginia doesn't pay us the hospital for the telehealth medicine. Even we want to help. So we need to, to understand the local policies and the local government you know, in, in, in every state to to that. But again, I think it's responsibility of the big centers to get in touch with the community and, and, and create more educational programs. Since Jorge asked me to chime in, I will. Um, I think it, the, nationally it's, it's really tricky. Uh, local state laws, reimbursement drives a lot of what we do. Uh, on one of my slides, I had just a reference to a hub and spoke model called Project Echo, which at the heart of it, when you think of it conceptually, it's a really elegant model to link primary care doctors to neurologists, epileptologists, or link neurologists to epileptologists to bring that higher level of epilepsy care. So if it's such an, and it's, it's easy to implement, on the face of it, it's not expensive, so then where does it fail and why is it not sustainable? Because it doesn't, it doesn't the, the word, are, the three letters RVU are not attached to it. So unfortunately, you know, a lot of finances and the economics do drive this. But I think also sending the message and maybe, and again, this may just be kind of a 
pie in the sky kind of uh, statement that I'm going to make. You know, we heard about epilepsy surgery, advanced treatments of epilepsy being seen at an epilepsy center. Even thinking about those treatments saves money in the long run. So that's the kind of message I think if we can drive that home over and over and over again, uh, it's an important message to drive home. When that will take, whether that will take, but I don't think because it hasn't taken so far, it should not be something that we stop doing. I'll make a couple of comments that may relate a little bit. By the way, I've operated at Benjamin Bloom Hospital before. It's a wonderful place. Last time I was there, they had six pediatric neurosurgeons, and they were training the whole area. Um, we talked earlier this morning about the Lancet Commission study on essential access to surgical care, and out of that initiative in 2015 was born an organization called the G4 Alliance. I don't know if you've heard of that, but G4 Alliance is SOTA care, surgical obstetric trauma and anesthesia care. It's an international group that's working together and has been very effective at the World Health Organization level in trying to make inroads into access to surgery, primarily trauma, as you could imagine, and, and obstetrical things. But that's an organization worth knowing about. The second is that in many low-income countries, they've been supported by the World Bank long enough that servicing their national debt is more than their health care budget as a nation. And there's currently some discussion going on at the World Bank level about forgiving the debt to some of those countries so that they can increase their health care spending, which I think would help a great deal. To, to hog the mic, but a different, a different question. So they have the health train in India. Uh, they have medication deliveries in Malawi, et cetera, um, miles and miles away during natural disasters. Can you guys speak to what we can learn here in the US about how they mitigate and improve access in many of these countries? that we could potentially do here. I know the Carolinas are trying to do some of that delivery, but. I don't think any of us here, I mean, as you can see, we're passing the microphone across the table because we all have an answer to this. The easier questions. But, um, <laughs> no, but I think making access to care in general, I think it's, I've, I've been saying this, it starts at the beginning. And I think increasing the, comfort level of a primary care doctor to write for an ethosuximide prescription for a child with absence and not just farm that kid off to a neurologist. Um, if a child transfers care from one state to another, by the time a child is getting settled down and the family is figuring out what to do, God knows I'm in the middle of all that still, uh, is to have somebody in the community who is that partner. So I think our academic hospitals, our societies, places like the American Academy of Pediatrics nationally are pretty powerful places that can deliver these messages. And I think it is, you know, education, communication, education, communication. It's not going to solve problems, but it's a place to start. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to mention very quickly in, in a few seconds that China was a good example for that also with the campaign against epilepsy. Uh, you know, China proved that they, I think they, they achieved diagnosis in about, I don't remember exactly, 60,000 patients in rural China, and they trained the PCPs to deliver medication, and they treated about, I don't remember, probably 30,000 uh, patients with phenobarbital, because that's what they had, but they did it. So I agree, training to whoever you have, right, when you have child neurology. And access, as you mentioned, you gave a nice, a nice example that in Africa and other places, they use even drones yes. to, to transport medication. So use of technology that is going to be cheaper in the past can probably be used in areas here that are very inaccessible. Yeah. Yes. It's, that's, it's, it's interesting that we have that low-hanging fruit. So we have done questionnaire virtual studies in the U.S. that now persons outside the U.S. are using our technology, and we are not using it here. <laughs> 
So I'm going to be maybe less pessimistic about PCPs in the U.S. and suggest a, a model that we've incorporated. Uh, I'm involved uh, in a project that's in north central Nigeria. Uh, in a little over a year, we uh, diagnosed and treated 1,800 new onset epilepsy kids. Huge amount of young kids. But the way we did it is we spent a year training nurse practitioners that live in the bush with iPads. They had to go through a series of modules, and they were dedicated to epilepsy. That's all they do. They go from village to village. They pass the test that said they could recognize, you know, this is a classic history for Brian Rolandic. This is what they like. This is, you know, you go, you think of every electroclinical syndrome we see. Uh, and they went from village to village, and they were backed up by three local pediatric neurologists in Nigeria. But literally, the local neurologists just saw the folks that they couldn't figure out. So they were probably seeing like a single digit percentage of all the kids that these NPs were seeing, because most of it is. You can train, it's like having a senior resident, right? Uh, and they go village to village, they had the family's trust, they, they checked on them every month to make sure they were getting their medicine, they brought medicine to them, uh, they stayed on top of this, and you could actually show a dramatic improvement in their treatment. And I think that's the only model that's gonna work in the US. We're never gonna have enough child neurologists, but if we had folks like this for rural areas and where I live, Kentucky, you know, West Virginia, you name it, that were then backed up to child neurologists, that, and these, they're getting regular updates in their care and the staff, then it's a, it's a doable you know, model. But I think that's the model. And it's cost effective, because you're, you're buying less expensive folks to do the bulk of the work um, as well. So I think that's a model that you know, actually could work. No, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, even, so uh, years ago, I was involved in a project that involved training community health workers in the middle of nowhere, rural India. I, even I don't know where that place in India is. Um, and what we showed in that, it was really a feasibility study, and what we showed was training community health workers who were not even medical people could go out into the community, they could deliver health questionnaires to pregnant women and children, and the bystander effect of that simple intervention was that entire community, their, their just self-awareness and access to medical care improved. Um, really, you know, again, low-hanging fruit, as Dave said, uh, is, Primary care doctors can become experts in rescue medicines. They, that is not something that it, you need to do an epilepsy fellowship for. Uh, primary care doctors can become experts in, if you are taking an anti-seizure medicine, you know, there are all these comorbidities that they can handle. So I think there is a lot of opportunity because that will free up time for neurologists and epileptologists to do that level four treatment, level three treatment that you really want to spend time on. and. That way you are empowering primary care doctors in, in this process also. I, I completely agree. And, and then I'll, I'll say something that I probably should not say in a group of neurologists, but it worked in that area, is um, we started this project five years ago. All the rural folks in the bush you know, would have intermittent flip phones, but as time has gone on, they have all of our old Apple phones that we don't need anymore because they're whatever, model seven, six, eight. So they all now had phones with videos. So in the last couple of years of our project, what the nurse practitioners happen, they go to the communities and then they get a video of the kid doing something. And we realized that, you know what, 90% of the kids, we could make a really accurate diagnosis of seizure tape off that video without getting an EEG. So literally a couple percentage of our whole population have ever had an EEG to define their electroclinical syndrome because you can use iPhone videos, you know, it's so good and the parents have them. And, you know, makes sense for what we do in practice too, right? But the EGs are part of our livelihood and how we generate our VUs. So, but if you want to be cost effective, you, yeah, that's the much easier way to do it. And everybody has iPhones nowadays. Any other questions? Nearing our time. All right, well, thank you. Uh, both did a great job. Tough, tough questions. <laughs> <laughs>